With me this morning is Dr. Nawal Amar, who is a professor and dean of the Faculty of Criminology, Justice and Policy Studies at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. Her recent research includes work on terrorism, domestic violence in Egypt, street children in Egypt, and violence against immigrant women in the U.S. Nawal has just left Kent State University, where, in her 14 years there, she was a professor and served as an associate dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. She was also graduate coordinator for the Justice Studies Department and the director of Women's Studies. A cultural anthropologist who has been concerned with issues of justice, public policy, women, and Islamic cultures, she's published over 50 manuscripts, book chapters, refereed articles, and reports. Also a consultant to the UN, she has participated in conferences for that uh, organization. Good morning, uh, Dr. Amar. Good morning. Now, my, my first question. In your article, An Islamic Response to the Manifest Ecological Crisis, Issues of Justice, you propose a retrieval of an Islamic response to the ecological crisis, a retrieval of something that has been long forgotten. Um, what, what has what has Islam forgotten, or have, have, have Muslims lost their way? I don't think Islam has forgotten much. I think Muslims have forgotten Islam. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in, in terms of um, Islamic response to the ecology and the environment, Muslims have definitely forgotten some basics about their religion. Mm -hmm. And so part of what I'm trying to uh, advocate for is to retrieve something that already exists, not to reinvent a religion, but to go back to the uh, classic manuscripts, including, of course, the eternal Quranic uh, text and all the other historical uh, manuscripts that exist that are very well documented. Mm -hmm. Muslims have been uh, pioneers very early on in, in indexing and writing and maintaining libraries. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot written about uh, Islam and the environment, and Muslims have not done that lately. Now, now why is that? There, there is a study which I came across involving uh, your study of in, inmates in the prison system. Uh -huh. Does that touch on that idea of... Well, it's interesting that in, in that, that study we did on uh, Muslim inmates in Ohio State prisons, uh, basically we were trying to figure out what, what are inmates learning in Islam. Most of them were converted inside the prison. Mm -hmm. And if you find, I mean, the, the article basically shows that Muslims have learned the rituals. When they convert, they learn the, the rituals and not the core faith values. Mm -hmm. So they all know how to pray, and they learn how to pray, and they learn how to uh, fast, and they know all these kinds of interesting rituals, but none of them reads the actual text. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the... Um, conversion becomes an issue of uh, interpretation of other people. Mm -hmm. And since Islam and the Quran is in Arabic, there are very few people who either read the language, and those who are native speakers are mostly illiterate. You know, 60% of the women are illiterate in, in that part of the world, the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. And so what you end up having now is you have people who are Muslims through interpretation of others. And we all know the biases of others when they interpret text. So what we have today is an Islam that has been interpreted through certain ideologies. And I call them the ideology of the oil market, mm -hmm. um, rather than the ideology of Islam and faith. Now, could, could you explain, explain that in terms of is the oil market? Well, I mean, partly what you're dealing with is a global world in which there are... Uh, uh, strong Muslim nations because they are sitting on oil wells. And this is like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and Qatar and all these places where, you know, oil is really a, a very important uh, resource for them. And they are, uh, and it's it's important global resource. So what you have now is Islam interpreted through this value system of oil which is very different from either nomadic Islam, which, uh, not necessarily nomadic, but it was more um, uh, urban, uh, traditional I Islamic setting, 
or even the uh, industrial market where there was a uh, certain ideological development to lead us to a market. So we have a maldeveloped uh, Islamic society um, based on sudden wealth, little time to develop, um, and it is now dictating and interpreting Islam to maintain its power. And what is the outcome? The outcome is maldeveloped Islam, Islam that does not, uh, that is not genuine, that is not in the text, um, that is basically serving a patriarchal um, ideology. Um, that's really the outcome. It's a, it's a skewed, maldeveloped Islamic interpretation of the religion. Now, how does that impact on um, the economic uh, welfare of the state in terms of equity and um, uh, distributive justice? Well, I mean, if you look at the Islamic world, it's, it, it, it's not a uniform economically uh, in terms of its economic welfare. Uh, among the most, the richest nations in per capita income in the world are, I think it's the United Arab Emirates and mm -hmm. Kuwait. Mm -hmm. Uh, among the poorest is, uh, I, I think it's Bang, um, Bangladesh, which both are, is, are, 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 the three nations are Islamic nations. So what, it, what the impact is that you really don't have distributive justice in, uh, among Muslim countries because maldevelopment in general um, is, is uh, you know, causes that kind of mal or, or lack of distribution of income. And so you have power, in, you know, vested in a few, uh, uh, in a small group of people who control the wealth, and the rest don't. I mean, there's no distribution of, of wealth in Islam. The economic basis of Islamic justice is the distribution of income and wealth, and you don't have that in, in among Islamic nations. Okay, so yeah, because you quote a, a famous uh, Islamic scholar of uh, of Islam, Harani. Uh -huh. who writes that Islam could also be a basis of economic life, and if accepted, that will ensure social justice and liberate humans from servitude. So Islam can be a source, then, for right economics and, and, and in that sense, address the environmental crisis. Yeah, Islam, I mean, Islamic economics, I'm, I'm no economist, but from my readings of Islamic, uh, of, of, the Islamic of the Quranic texts and, and Islamic interpretations of, of economic life, Islam at its very heart, one of its pillars, is redistribution of income. Mm -hmm. Almsgiving, the whole idea of almsgiving, which is one of the pillars of Islam, is to redistribute income. Um, you know, it goes to the government, and then the government basically redistributes it. And if you're not a Muslim, you have to pay a tax. Mm -hmm. So there is, within the Islamic State, there are these concepts of redistribution of income. Uh, there's also the idea of usury and interest rate comes from the idea of uh, the classic Marxist idea of, of uh, the idea of value, that you should not be paying, uh, you know, more, um, an, an extra amount of money um, for commodities that don't have an, ex an intrinsic value. Right. And so Islam in many ways has at its basis, um, you know, at, at least the beginning, I'm not saying Islam is the answer to everything, because it can't be in this modern world. But it has at its very roots uh, a, a basic understanding of the distribution of income, social justice, taking care of the poor, these kinds of issues. Okay. So um, in terms of the treatment of women in Islamic communities, how is that, um, how is that, how is that linked to the environmental crisis? Is there, can there, is there retrieval involved in, in, in the treatment of women as well? Of course. Mm -hmm. When you abuse your environment, uh, and you abuse your, uh, you know, the precious commodities and resources you have, either by over-consuming or by, uh, you know, polluting, uh, women are perceived, at least from an ecofeminist perspective, as one of those, uh, uh, one of those resources that get abused. And so the abuse of women in Islamic societies now contributes to the, uh, is part and parcel of the entire ideology of abuse of the environment. So we abuse women by having them uh, uh, have too many children. We abuse women's health by not allowing them access to good health care. We abuse women's potential in building communities by not sending them to schools and educating them. 
So the idea of abusing the environment um, is not necessarily only for natural resources, but also human resources. When they're abused, they impact the environment. Okay. So uh, population growth rate, then, in, is, in Muslim countries, uh, you know, it is among the highest in the world. Uh, the crude birth rate of the 46 Muslim countries is 1% higher than that of the developing world as a whole. So uh, w- what would you say lies at the root of that population growth, and why have family planning programs failed to be effective? This is a very complex issue, and a simple answer is not going to uh, give it. So let me give you the complexity Please. of it. Please. Um, population growth is basically an issue, uh, to begin with, uh, of mal- m- misinterpretation of the, of the religion. I, I mean, the, the Islamic text is very clear, the Quranic text is very clear about popula- you know, uh, controlling population or regulating population. So while it does not allow certain ways of birth control, it's very permissible, uh, permissive uh, uh, in, about using other forms of birth control. So there is this idea that the m- misinterpretation comes across the radio and the television and the newspapers and even just in small mosques, which basically says Islam does not allow birth control. So that's one reason why you have an increase in population through uh, population increase, uh, I mean uh, birth rate increase. So that's one. The other one is a more modern phenomenon, which is a response to a Western or a perceived Western ideology, uh, a hegemony of Western ideology. That is, the West, uh, there's this feeling, at least in the last quarter of a century, that the West wants the Islamic world to be like them. But the Islamic world has different ways of looking at things. And uh, so they, it's perceived as an attempt to colonize the Islamic world in the modern era. So there is a rejection of this modern idea of birth control. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you combine those two, uh, plus the, the poverty, I mean, it, just simple poverty and lack of education, when you don't educate the women, Mm-hmm. What do you expect? I mean, the idea that we educate women uh, only to go become economic producers in the labor market is not enough. You educate women to make certain decisions. And when women are not educated and they don't understand what it means, you know, a lot of women, for example, after they have a child and they're nursing, they think now they can, you know, they're free. They won't get pregnant, which doesn't happen, actually. And so lots of women get pregnant by mistake. Mm-hmm. So all these factors, the, the lack of education of women, um, the malinterpretation or misinterpretation of Quranic texts, and the idea that, that uh, population planning or family planning is a Western ideology. Now, if you look at certain countries, like Indonesia, for example, Indonesia succeeded in uh, its family planning, uh, uh, at, at least campaign, until 10 years ago. And it was basically the anti-West movement of fundamentalism that basically brought back or increased uh, the, the, or, or debunked the family planning success of Indonesia. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So <clears throat> is, there's, is it true that there's an Islamic belief which predominates today, which which claims that the ecological crisis is, is predestined by God and should be accepted? And this will have to be our last question, because we're wrapping yeah, up. But. Absolutely. There is a belief that, I mean, and that's the increasing fundamentalist vision of Islam, mm-hmm. that everything is predestined and we need to take it. Uh, and this idea of changing our destiny, again, is Western ideology that's trying to hegemonize the Islamic society. And, and it's, it's in everything. The idea that, you know, we, what we have now is predestined, and we just have to accept it. Uh, and it isn't only in population increase and in ecological problems. Mm-hmm. What about um, <coughs> concepts like, is it, is it Tawheed and uh, Haya? You, you yeah. mentioned in your articles, too. Um, in relating to a retrieval of these traditional dogma in addressing these? Well, the, the notion of Tawheed is an explanation of how Islam basically 
uh, uh, calls for the protection of the environment. And it's different from Christianity and Judaism and, and Buddhism. And, and, and it's basically the idea that um, uh, humans and, and God's creation in general, humans are one of God's creations, and earth and the environment is God's creation, are one and united. Um, and they are interdependent. And to protect, for humans to protect nature is part of the worshipping of God. Now, you don't worship nature, you worship God, but mm -hmm. you protect nature uh, as, a, as a sign of worshipping God. Right. And, and Haya, am I pronouncing that Haya right? is, yeah, Haya is basically one way of uh, it, its um, dignified respect of God's creation. It's, it's, a, it's a, an ethical uh, rule that you have Haya. It means you have dignified respect of other people, uh, of nature in general, of all God's creation. Mm -hmm. uh, so both Tawheed is a, is a philosophy that explains Islamic understanding of the environment and humans relation, uh, human beings and their relationship to, to nature. And Haya is a, an ethical rule that we can use um, and it's at the, at the core of the Islamic culture to protect the environment. Well, well, Dr. Nawal Amar, thank you for, for joining us this morning. Um, Dr. No D Nawal Amar is a professor and dean of the Faculty of Criminology, Justice, and Policy Studies at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. And, and thank you again, Dr. Amar. Thank you very much.